So we are into the uh, closing remarks and reflections part of the day. Uh, so just we will have some remarks by Ray Baxter uh, next. Then after that, I will ask people to come to the microphone, uh, starting with Frank Loy, to share reflections or your thoughts of the day, what stood out to you, um, things that maybe you want to reiterate or something that hasn't been said that you want to make certain is on uh, the record. So I'll be asking the roundtable members uh, to be thinking about your thoughts uh, for that. Uh, but at this time, I'm going to introduce um, uh, Ray Baxter, who is a health policy advisor. He was previously uh, Kaiser Permanente Senior Vice President for Community Benefit Research and Health Policy. There he built the largest community benefit program in the U.S., investing over $2 billion annually in community health. And just one highlight from his bio, which you can read in the materials, is that in 2006, he received the CDC Foundation Hero Award for addressing the health consequences of Hurricane Katrina in the Gulf Coast. So please welcome uh, Ray Baxter to the podium. Thank you. Uh, Sani, and uh, for that kind introduction, and first let me express uh, my appreciation for the incredible work that all the speakers and contributors to today's program uh, made today and have made in the work that they do uh, every day. I wish that far more people had been able to attend this session uh, and the incredible uh, experience, the incredible learnings from today. I hope uh, in the virtual world out there, there are far more people uh, who've been listening and will continue to listen and that others will follow the written proceedings uh, of this uh, workshop. If there were, was one set of messages uh, today that rang throughout the presentations and panels we had, uh, I think it was that the health effects of climate change are real, they are here now, and they are not fair or equitable, and they can be prevented. Let's take a glimpse at each of those uh, from the speakers today. The health effects of climate change are real, and they are here now. Uh, Jonathan Patz talked about urban heat, extreme weather, air pollution, allergens, vectors, vector and waterborne disease, water and food supply effects, mental health, refugees, and political instability, and really set a frame around the very diverse and powerful set of effects on health that are related to climate change. We didn't talk about every single instance and in one of those, but we did talk about an extraordinarily diverse array of health effects. Um, and the specific forms that they are taking in our communities today. Um, we did talk uh, about a lot of those. We talked about heat in Louisville. We talked about extreme heat and mice and tick-borne disease and drinking water in Milwaukee. We talked about storms in New York and Baltimore, sinking air quality, drought and groundwater pollution in California, the effects on traditional foods for native peoples. And no one mentioned fire, but for those of us in the West, that's become a regular fact of summer life with all the health effects associated with it. George's Benjamin summed this up as the urgency, the fierce urgency of now, and we cannot let that fall off the radar screen of the people we are trying to reach. A second theme that rang throughout the sessions was that the health effects of climate change are experienced inequitably. George Benjamin, from the beginning, called out the issue um, of the ethics and the morality around inequity and inequitable effects. Uh, Jonathan, again, laid out, as did the Louisville folks, climate change and health effects as a moral issue. The Milwaukee framework explicitly embraced the issue of equity. The New York City experience that was described to us demonstrated the particular vulnerability, just for one example, of the frail elderly in institutions. The New Hampshire uh, use of the CDC BRACE framework 
um, explicitly identifies vulnerable population at risk as part of its way of focusing. Baltimore and the work being done there explicitly acknowledged how a legacy of racism and segregation still shape inequity and vulnerability related to climate change as well as certainly other forces. And then there is the fundamental global inequity that Jonathan described with the map of the world, that we are the generators and the most vulnerable people in the least developed parts of the world bear the greatest and first effects of the health effects of climate change. And finally, the, the message that the health effects of climate change and climate change itself can be addressed. Jonathan described a simple solution in one sense, reduce carbon, create a healthier environment immediately, whether you believe in climate change or not. Doing the most important things for health and for the principal causes of ill health and reduced functionality will help the environment themselves, walking more and eating better. We heard that the politics of all of this are not impossible. The Kentucky and California examples stood out to me. That idealistic goals can be reached and that the economics, in fact, can be positive, not just theoretical. The Gunderson presentation, in particular, um, showed that. And that it is possible to do comprehensive planning and preparedness. The examples in New Hampshire, in New York, and in Baltimore, uh, among others. So a couple of questions remained for me for today. One of those is around local action. Is local action enough and can it be scaled? And the second is, what is the balance between work at prevention and mitigation and work on response and resilience. How do we prioritize and how do we make those decisions? Let's go first to the question of is local action enough? It sometimes seems that the more local people are, the more focused they are, the more optimistic they are, and the more global they are, the more negative they are. Why is that? Let's look at some of the examples that we heard from today. The Kentucky vision of a transition to a low coal or no coal future could have a very big effect. It could model this kind of just transition. It could demonstrate a change that is, in a way, beyond belief. That is powerful even though their actions alone will not change the global facts of climate change or its effects on health. The Gunderson model and the Kaiser model are models that drive visions for an entire sector of the economy and that if scaled and adopted and spread could make a significant difference well beyond those more local kinds of actions. The examples of comprehensive planning and preparedness in New Hampshire and Baltimore and New York um, are, are, again, things that defy our common cynicism about our ability to plan together across sectors and address such big problems. New York, we had an example of scaling from previous hospital cooperation around bioterrorism. Baltimore talked about their scaling the use of data. The BRACE work specifically looks at learning from other interventions. But the conclusion that I come to from listening to today is that there is still a huge gap between local projects and local commitments and the kind of global change that ultimately will be needed. What happens at the regional level? What is the role of government now and of public policy? How far can rather unique private projects get? Climate doesn't respect governmental boundaries. It doesn't affect them, whether, uh, respect them whether they are local or state or national. So what does that require of us in the approach 
going forward. Let me also raise again the issue of the balance between focusing on adaptation and resilience versus focusing on prevention and mitigation and how we prioritize. Louisville was a, a, an interesting example of Ghent. It combined an integrated comprehensive heat program that included not just reforestation, but also addressing carbon reduction and heat generation. Some of this seems to depend on whether you're a major generator or extractor. If you are, you potentially have very big levers to pull that can have big effects on the preventive or mitigation side. If you have few levers to pull or fewer resources, you're almost forced into the resilience and response mode. But again, I ask, will that be enough if things are left to that chance? You can't afford to be second-guessed, particularly if you're an elected official. So New York has no choice but to be prepared for the next Irene and Sandy. It has to focus on resilience and on preparedness for that kind of event. But what is its role with respect to generation and to con contribution to the problem? We didn't talk today about the extensive programs around reducing vehicular traffic, moving more to mass transit, and so on and so forth. But they are part of the kind of total and, I think, balanced effort that is probably required. New Hampshire was an interesting model of a blend of local and topical approaches spread across the state and focused at different sites, and then using a comprehensive framework with the BRACE approach. Baltimore had an interesting approach of blending all hazard mitigation planning and specific uh, climate change planning and using an explicit lens of equity for all of it. Milwaukee and New Hampshire had elements of that too. Kaiser uses a kind of burden of harm measuring stick for its prioritization of environmental activities. So in conclusion, we've danced around the political realities that we face today in this country. We are in a time when responsibility is apparently being devolved to the lowest levels of government or to individual communities or private actors. And there is certainly a case that those local actors are best suited to effective action especially around resilience. But I do note that I counted only three speakers today who talked about how the emissions and practices of their own institutions contribute to the problem and what they intended to do about it or were doing about it. We cannot leave ourselves only on one side of the problem. How do we assure that the role historically played by public policy and regulation is filled? California is an outstanding example of what can be achieved when communities, innovators, businesses, and government policy are aligned around the problem, around the evidence, and around the solutions. So as we pull back and zoom back from that across the United States, do we think that local projects and local plans will add up to regional and global change that addresses the fundamental drivers of adverse climate change? Or will those individual actors and communities and organizations and jurisdictions default almost entirely to disaster preparedness and a narrow, somewhat self-serving kind of resilience planning that is by force almost totally defensive and may tend to be largely reserved for the privileged and the advantaged, while the planet at its larger level continues to deteriorate. That is a challenge we will have to continue to meet. Neither one of these is a reasonable choice. We have to focus on all of them. 
So with those thoughts, let me again thank all of our extraordinary contributors today, both for the knowledge that they've imparted to us and for the great work that they are doing in their communities and in their institutions. I hope together we can build on today's convening as a foundation and provide some momentum for the challenges of the enormous work we face ahead. Thank you very much. I'll turn it back to Sam. So, uh, Frank, let me have you uh, come forward. Frank Loy is the chair of the Roundtable on Environmental Health Sciences, Research, and Medicine. He will give us his reflections for the day, and those of you on the Roundtable and in the audience, I'll get ready to share yours. Thank you, Santa. Uh, and let me say, Mr. Baxter, I've been in a lot of conferences in my life, and I've seen a, and heard a lot of summaries. I have never heard one that is better than your summary of the day's proceedings. I congratulate you, and I thank you, because you helped put us together. <laughs> and I want to thank uh, Kathleen Stratton, who pulled this uh, uh, session together on our behalf, on the behalf of our roundtable. She was not aided by the weatherman, I must say. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, short of that, she controlled everything and did that very well. Thank you, Kathleen. Um, <clears throat> so we had a, a well-planned and a balanced program along the lines that Mr. Baxter was talking about. Um, and I think we've established some things and we've left some things open. We've established the seriousness of the problem and we've sort of uh, uh, addressed fully what can be done uh, to address the problems both at the local and at the more national level. And Jonathan Patz's slides particularly were helpful as were the, were the opening comments of Dr. Benjamin. The question I want to ask is why, given the overwhelming evidence of the problem, and the very thoughtful approaches that we heard described, why is it so hard that to address this problem at anything like the scale it deserves? Why is that? And I think the answer is threefold, or maybe four. One, the problem looks to a lot of people like being in the future. Now, in some places, you can actually feel it and sense it in terms of wildfires and water problems, but often you can't. And so it looks like something out there. And second, there is a feeling on the part of some that it's not really true. Uh, and that, uh, well, I think everyone in this room understands the problem. Um, for the public at large is a serious issue. And it is, of course, exploited by interests that uh, are benefited by that and by uh, some intellectual, uh, electoral leaders, uh, if I may mischaracterize them that way, um, that, uh, that provide that uh, ammunition for that thought. And the third thing I think that hurts uh, our ability to address this problem is a sense of hopelessness. The damn thing's going to happen. It's happening right now. It's happening all over the globe. What can we do? Not much. That feeling is a, a, a terrible problem for those of us who are trying to address it. And I think we have to uh, acknowledge, and this was alluded to today, that those of us who care about the problem have made some mistakes. Uh, I think, uh, for example, uh, <clears throat> uh, we were absolutely right in trying to get rid of coal as a fuel, but we did not. We did not adequately address the problem of those who were going to bear the brunt of that change. And I think it is also true that and uh, several speakers here from uh, Louisville and uh, from other places 
made the point of the need, the need for process. You can't just get to where you want to go by being right. You have to have a process that involves the people. And I think we in the environmental community and sometimes in the health community are not as good as we ought to be at really believing in that process and really working that process. And it is important to do that. So where does the health community fit into this? I think it, it does this way. Um, for many who are not knowledgeable about this, citizens of our country, um, if somebody talks about climate change and they would like to get a sense of what really is at work here and what really is true and what is baloney, if somebody wants that, uh, they're not going to turn to the scientists because they probably don't know any scientists. Imagine you're a, a person in a, in a red state with a, or a red county. Where are you going to turn to for news? You're not, you don't know the scientists. You're not going to go to the scientists. You're not going to go to the environmentalists, for God's sake. But where do you go for some thoughtful analysis and for some thoughtful um, discussion and for some thoughtful education. The answer is you're going to go to people whom you trust, leaders whom you trust from other walks in life, having nothing to do with climate change, very probably. And where are those? One group comes from the faith community. The faith community has a huge opportunity and a huge responsibility. And we can't leave it to Pope Francis to do that. The second uh, community is the education, the higher education community, where uh, there are leaders who have uh, a status in the community that gives them a platform. And the third is the health community. The third is the health community, both in terms of institutions like hospitals, but also in terms of your your doctor and your nurse. Those are respected figures in our community, in every community, in communities that have very few other respected figures. And that's why I think it is worthwhile for the health community to pay such attention to this problem. Because through the efforts of the health community, one can build the kind of base of support that is needed for action. Uh, <clears throat> I am involved with an organization that has done some uh, research and analysis breaking down um, the population of, of the United States into their attitude on climate change. And there are correlations. There are correlations between the age of the person you talk to and their attitude. There are correlations bet between the gender of the person you talk to. Women get it more than men. There are correlations between level uh, of income and their attitude toward uh, climate change. There is correlation with geography in the United States and climate change very heavy uh, um, correlation. But right now, the biggest correlation, the thing that will help you predict how a person will feel about climate change is party affiliation. That's crazy. And it's very true. And again, what kind of individual, what kind of individual might be able to actually impact on that? And it is a, an individual who is not by reason of his or her profession on one side or the other. Not known to be there or not known to be there, but has a totally different point of entry. And that is the health community. So from all aspects that I can see, it, this, th what we're talking about is a, is a public health problem of absolutely first order. And this society of public health professionals is the one can address it most effectively and help us out of this dilemma. Thank you.
Thank you so much, uh, Frank. So as people start coming to the microphone to, to make comments, I'm just gonna make some uh, closing thank yous. Uh, also want to extend that this was a very fruitful collaboration between two national academies roundtables, the Roundtable on Population Health Improvement and the Roundtable on Environmental Health Sciences Research and Medicine. The roundtables will publish a proceeding of the workshop, and in a few days, the videos and PowerPoint presentations will be archived and available for future viewing on the web pages of both roundtables. I'd like to thank uh, Alina Bachu, Darla Thompson, Kathleen St uh, Statton, uh, and Hope Hare, the staff of the roundtables, for their work in bringing this to fruition. I'd also, again, like to thank the members of the planning committee. Uh, who served often as moderators on the individual panels. And now, with those comments, I'd like to open the final session for a few minutes to, to have roundtable members uh, and any of those else in the audience who'd like to reflect on their learnings uh, for the day. So um, I think, George, you were first. Go ahead, and then Martha. Thank you, Sandy. George Isham. Uh, uh, Senior uh, uh, Fellow at the uh, Health Partners Institute and Co-Chair of the Roundtable on Population Health. Uh, it's nice to be able to break, beat Martha to the punch here in terms of final comments. Uh, and I always look forward to what she has to say. In thinking about today's um, comments, we heard earlier in the day and then in the last comment uh, by Frank Loy, um, some reflection on the fact that the rationale of health would be the savior for the environmental sort of issue. Um, I, I hope I'm not too broadly paraphrasing your point. And yet when we think about this issue from the standpoint of the round table on population health, we try to think about the uh, rationales um, that are broader in the other sectors for mobilizing uh, more effective action to address some of the issues that we see from within healthcare and public health. Um, it's a very interesting sort of, 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 uh, of kind of, of, of thing. I think I reflected earlier uh, the comment that if the dialogue occurs at the level of politicians, party politics, you get one sort of dialogue that uh, may not be uh, very constructive from either point of view. And if you look at it as a very technical, scientific dialogue, again, the point I think the last summary made, uh, it, it doesn't uh, resonate very broadly beyond the technical uh, uh, field of expertise from which it, it arises. So it seems to me that the challenge for us is, is somewhat twofold. One is to think about the uh, logic model or the uh, framework by which these various factors interact with one another. And not to be so parochial about either being from the health sector and thinking health is the only outcome or being from the environmental sector and thinking it's the only outcome, but really trying to think about that confused sort of, of, uh, of uh, uh, field of relationships, causation, and so forth, uh, that might help us to inform um, uh, what we might do about the situation. And I think one of the things that we might do about it is to create a lot more communication in that middle field between politics and scientific expertise that begins to um, lay out these uh, issues in very broad, more publicly understandable uh, uh, forms that not only uh, communicate to the general public, but quite frankly, uh, communicate across these technical silos in ways that are compelling uh, to people that have influence within there. And I don't think we do a good enough job of that. Uh, and then I, I'm really, uh, very encouraged by the examples we've seen today. Uh, it once again uh, uh, energizes. I, I couldn't uh, in any way hope to approach the excellent summary, uh, uh, two summaries that, that we've heard, uh, but I'm very, very encouraged by that. So I hope we have the, um, uh, the wisdom to begin to build bridges of communication that maybe start with the two sectors here today. Uh, and build on that for creating some of these solutions going forward. I'm, I'm very encouraged by that. Uh, thank you very much. I'm Martha Gold, and I'm at the New York Academy of Medicine. 
uh, and I'm a member of the Roundtable. And I, I wanted to thank everybody for a really interesting and thought-provoking day. Uh, this is great. Um, I have a lot of thoughts that hopefully will come together in some format that you can follow. Um, one is, I, I think, essentially is the framing issue. Um, and I, I think I, I had a, a conversation with Mr. Zimmer at lunchtime, uh, who comes from the Republican side of the aisle. And I, one of the questions I have is, why is it that one side of our political process seems to be less interested in this whole area of climate change. Aren't there children coming home from school with the same kinds of questions that the children of Democrats are coming home from school and saying the environment is changing? So what's going on that the message is not sort of resonating? Some of this may be simply about sort of political affiliation and sort of being a good team member. Uh, some of it may be more nefarious than that. But some of it may be that we need to find sort of stronger ways, um, more personal ways to influence the politicians. Because as, as Ray Baxter was suggesting, I think this is not going to work simply on a local level. And there are all kinds of signs that we're sort of, sort of falling backwards in what we're doing with the environment, which are extraordinarily um, troubling. Um, George has sort of said uh, earlier today that the way to motivate people is um, to give them a sort of a positive view of, of what life would bring if climate were better. I think that's optimistic. I think prospect theory teaches us that, in fact, people respond more strongly to things they might lose than to things that they might gain. And I almost think that the sky is falling is a sort of a better way to approach things. But I think these are things that we need to test. You know, people respond to th problems that are going to happen to them immediately. The difficulty with climate is that unless you're on the eastern and western coasts or a low-lying countryside or flooding is going on in your environment or fires, there's a great swath of the public that still has not had the experience of serious problems. And so we tend to, to delay. And the question is, how do we frame messages um, how do we bring more immediacy? I've always been a proponent of what the media and what the entertainment industry can bring for us. And I, I wonder whether there are some approaches there that we need to be thinking about. Um, I want to come back to this whole notion, which I think was a great one that, that Mr. Loy brought up and which uh, Georges Benjamin brought up earlier, which are the health professionals. And I wonder, as we see our patients individually, whether there is a way to not only inculcate the notion of what people can do individually that will promote their health, their exercise, more walking, uh, uh, their, their dietary kinds of intake, so that's a sort of a personal responsibility issue, but is there a role for us to talk more about people's roles as citizens? We seem to in this day and age be um, less activated as citizens. And I wonder what people think and whether the round table might consider whether the health professions have something to say about people being good citizens. Thank you. Yes. Hi, I'm Matt Kayleen from New Hampshire. I'll say something encouraging, I think, and, and relatively brief at the end. In New Hampshire, the university did a study where they said, well, you know, a third of the people basically in New Hampshire are Republican, a third are Democratic, and someone just mentioned that people affiliate their opinions on climate change um, to their political party, but a third are independent. So they looked at the day, the temperature on the day before, they asked the person if you believe in anthropogenic climate change, and then on day of, and they found out that on a, for independence, on uh, days where there was no big difference, they were basically not interested in climate. They didn't think it was human cause. But on the days where it had been cooler the day before and warmer on the day they asked them, they were straight up there with the Democrats and believing in it. So, you know, Americans are uh, short memories and uh, short sighted, but God love them. You know, they're malleable. And maybe we'll have the chance with some of those independents. <laughs> Yikes. I'm supposed to follow that. Um, so, uh, 
this has been an interesting day for me. And you know, I came here and I thought, oh, this is going to be like the most depressing thing ever. Um, but I'll come. But actually, I walk away from it uh, feeling convicted by actually in, in my multiple identities. Uh, first, as a grandfather, and uh, second, as a, a person of faith. Uh, thirdly, as a health professional, and um, find myself convicted by the by the four simple points. And thanks enormously to our prophet uh, Ray <laughs> for keeping this so radically sharply in front of us throughout the very first mullings as a roundtable. Maybe we should do something on on climate change. Uh, it's, it's real. It's now. It's not fair, but it's actionable. And I can tell you that although I have been very proud of stakeholder health as a group of morally driven, mission oriented healthcare systems, this has simply not crossed the minds of most of our faith based healthcare systems. Our faith partners have not raised this in any, with any of the clarity that uh, we heard numerous times today. And the prophetic witness of this is coming from uh, a Kaiser, uh, which is not a faith-based system, but obviously uh, has a, a deep moral drive on this issue. So I walk away convicted and extremely grateful to the, obviously, to the fabulous staff who puts together one feast after another <laughs> for us to learn from. But this one, this one's going to take some digesting. Thank you. I failed to mention that I'm a member of the Environmental Health Research and Medicine Roundtable. Um, four issues. First is, um, this is a tremendously successful meeting, but I wonder how, and this is all in the context of communication, and particularly risk communication, I wonder how um, it would help if we juxtapose the successes, obviously, that we've heard today with failures and how that would help the communication process. There are certainly studies, case studies of failures. Um, secondly, uh, the local examples gave us good um, illustrative ways to um, characterize assets. And I'm not sure that same characterization of assets has happened at the national level. Thirdly, if you um, consider risk communication and the principles around risk communication, a lot of message and message content we've had today. We spent some time, and particularly in the afternoon, around messengers and who could be uh, good messengers. And in, in fact, I, I agree that um, at the institutions of higher education, uh, Tulane, for example, we serve as that neutral broker for industry as well as for communities. Um, but it is um, the last piece of uh, dealing with um, culture um, and how we look at not only culture from an ethical pers ethnic perspective, but culture from a, a community's perspective, a community of scientists, the communities of, of health professionals, com communities of policymakers, and transforming uh, those cultures. Uh, and I think working together will be, will be very helpful. And I am obligated to leave you with a global sense of hope. Uh, I am very privileged to co-chair at the end of April um, it, an expert panel that will create a Caribbean-wide roadmap on climate change. And so uh, we can deal with the contributions that the US makes to those countries, but those countries are taking on that responsibility to take action. Thank you. Thank you. Last, last chance here. Any other um, summary comments to go into the record? Well, I have a, a few closing uh, comments. Won't take long so we can get out of here and face um, what uh, a snowstorm might be uh, beginning outside. That uh, I, I too felt encouraged by the day uh, as even as you think about uh, disasters and the, the increasing frequency of them,
but also was compelled in thinking around not just a deficit-based approach, but the asset-based. And uh, our first presentation talking about the opportunities uh, that are present here to actually advance a, a health agenda and what that would look like, and to have an asset and opportunity framework uh, here. I also um, felt encouraged that the communication principle that we have often talked about uh, in population health, that we don't lead with our issue uh, and that we don't lead with uh, the changing climate and possibly even not to lead with health, but to enter into a conversation about what matters to you in the constituent that we want to involve. What do you value and what do I value? And where's the Venn diagram and can't we do both? And I think that's something we're learning over and over again in communication and in that building trust. And the speaker who said, uh, check your agenda uh, at the door and work on building trust and a relationship so that you can go about co-creation. Um, so I think it's something we've heard before in other venues, and I think it's particularly pertinent to this issue uh, today. And then the message of hope that's come through already in a couple of reflections here all, uh, to this afternoon, and the good to great um, comment, quote from Collins, that was, face brutal facts, but never lose hope. Never lose hope. So with that, I want to say thank you again for coming. Thank you for all the work that went in uh, to getting this together and bringing this workshop to fruition. So with that, good evening. Have a great uh, rest of your day.